Welcome to Pastor Bill's Classroom. We are in our study of the Corinthian Letters, Lesson 35, entitled, Going for the Gold. Hello, welcome back. Our midweek study, we're in the book of 1 Corinthians. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verses 24 through 27. If you would like to start flipping over there. Uh, any of you like to run? I, I actually like to. I have it not doing it too well. Uh, how about uh, running long distances? That's kind of the way I like to run. I, short distance is kind of, I'm not very good. But I can keep running longer. I wonder if any of you have ever ran or considered running a marathon. Now that's a really long run. And I also wonder how many of us realize the, where the name marathon came from. It's not a random name. It actually was not a race to begin with, uh, and we learned this because of Greek history. The Greeks were in a war against the Persians. In fact, the Persians had invaded uh, Greece, and the Athenian Greeks were fighting the Persians in the plains of what's called Marathon, which is there, therefore thus the name. And uh, they had a problem. Uh, they needed more soldiers, and so they sent a guy on a run. His name was Phidippides. And he allegedly ran 300 miles round trip. Now, that's not 26 miles. That's not a marathon. That's way more than that. But allegedly, you know, while he's with him, I'm sure he walks some. But anyway, he makes this 300-mile round trip down to Sparta to get more soldiers. The problem about it was is that he didn't do it fast enough because obviously running 300 miles is going to take you a while. And uh, the Spartans, either he did it fast enough, but the Spartans get, didn't get there fast enough. Either way, the war was over before the Spartans ever got there. But the good news was is that the Greeks, the Athenians, had won. The bad news was is that uh, the Persians, as they retreated, they were retreating in the direction north. And north was the direction, I'm sorry, south was the direction of Athens itself. So the Athenians were fighting them up north of their city. They were retreating back towards their city, and so they were there unprotected. And so they take this same Phidippides, who had just run a 300-mile trip, round trip, and they require him to run another 26 miles, literally uphill almost all the way to Athens to warn the citizens of the impending, possibly impending attack. So he reaches the city, according to the story, 26 miles, that's where we come up with a distance for a marathon, and reaches the city, he warns them, and his final words as he gasps, rejoice, he says, we conquer, and he falls over dead. And that's sort of like me when I run around the block. <laughs> So that's where we get the name marathon from. And I want to be speaking to you not about so much about marathon, but using the marathon analogy because that's what Paul does effectively to speak about a different race, the details of a race called the Christian life. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27. I hope you're there. And uh, let's pray together and ask God's direction and uh, inspiration in our time. God, we do ask for that, those very things that you would open our eyes, our ears, our minds, our hearts to hear from you, to be changed, God, in whatever way you choose and see fit, to be glorified, God, in our lives, because that's what we exist for, and that's what we run for. Bless this time we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul must have been, on some level, a sports fanatic, because he uses so many athletic metaphors, so many analogies of, of athletics to refer to the Christian life. In fact, he uses more metaphors or analogies to the Christian life as, a, as a, some kind of sporting event, whether it be race or boxing or whatever it is, uh, than any other writer in the New Testament. In fact, all the other writers combined use less analogies than he, he does towards the sports. So 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. Here's one of them. We're going to be seeing several of those that Paul writes. Verses 24 through 27, do you not know, he says, that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. He's not talking about a literal physical race. He's talking about the race of, Christ, of the Christian life. We're in a contest here, and we're in a contest with ourselves and the call of God in our lives. Everyone who competes in the games, he, exercise, he says, exercises self-control in all things, they do it for receiving a perishable wreath, but we, if you will, do it for an imperishable wreath. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim, Paul says of his own life, I box in such a way as not beating the air, he's using two different analogies there, 
I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly, after I preach to others, I myself should be disqualified. And he's not talking about heaven's not in question here. Heaven is an assured thing for Paul. It's an assured thing for those who Paul is referring to. The Christian race means you've already entered the race because you placed your faith in Jesus Christ. That's never going to change. Heaven's not in question. What's in question is, will you be rewarded for the way you lived, or will you, the grace that God has given you, the eternal life God has given you, or will you not be rewarded when you enter heaven? Paul says, listen, I don't want to be disqualified, he says here. So we'd be considering several things based upon what Paul says. First of all, Paul writes this to a people who have been well, who have been well acquainted with the whole illustration, with a power of illustration for them as he writes to the Corinthian church because Corinth was only a little over 10 miles from where the original Olympic Games were held. So they were very familiar with this. Uh, Olympic athletes would stay with them whenever the Games were held. I don't know how often that they were held once a year, every four years, whatever it was. So this analogy is a very powerful one, and very powerful for us because it demonstrates to us to live the Christian life means to be in this a spiritual athlete. We can't just sit around. Uh, a, a spiritual couch potato is not what God's called us to be. He's called us to be athletes. And so that's, uh, like I said, a powerful uh, illustration. I, an athlete who runs a race a long distance to, to in the, the distance is their entire life here on earth. So how are you doing with that race? How's it going? Are you running well? Uh, training hard? Have you uh, slowed down? We have a lot of slowdown in the past year and a half, right? Because we're coming up on two years, actually been two years. Uh, since COVID, it's taken a lot of us out of the race because, well, because uh, afraid of getting sick. Um, we got sidelined. In many cases, we got stopped. I don't know if it's where you are, uh, whatever situation you're in, but I know it's true for our church. We have some people that really served hard here and now aren't serving. Uh, in fact, in many cases, we don't see them. What happened? Well, some unforeseen things, some difficult things. Nonetheless, does that mean we stay on the sidelines forever? Uh, have you slowed down? Could it be you find yourself on the sidelines underneath the shade watching the race pass you by? It's not too late to start again. And listen, the race needs you. And you need the race. We're going to see that together. There are going to be three main points I'm going to be following concerning the race that we are all in as believers. Number one, the Christian life is like a marathon. Huh, there you go. Number two, not all who run win the prize at the end. Some, there are some things we have to follow in order to do that. And then number three, we all are potential winners. Just because you fall on the wayside doesn't mean you can't get up and win. Get up, though. Don't stay where you are. Number one, the Christian life is like a marathon, number one, first of all, because both require rigorous training. Verse 25, right? We saw that. Buffet my body, he says. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things, but then they do have to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one, if you will. We do this. We, in order to compete as a, a marathon runner, for instance, uh, you have to be able to run a mile in less than five minutes. But you don't have to run just one mile in less than five minutes. Your average for the 26 miles of a marathon, if you want to compete, now, you can run a marathon and take three days, you know, but that's not very competitive. But if you want to run a marathon and you want to compete, your average has to be somewhere, your average mile has to be somewhere less than five minutes per mile, 26 miles. That's moving. Your body, you probably know this, really is not capable of such demands. In other words, we're not born with the ability to naturally one run 26 miles, five dipodies over here. The guy must have been in incredible shape. I mean, to run, walk, whatever it was, for 300 miles in order to get soldiers from Sparta, and then turn around and run uphill, and he really ran that one, for 26 miles afterwards? Wow. Such that it killed him? Well, there you go. Body's not made for that. So you have to make it do that. You have to train. You have to force your body to do what it doesn't naturally do. Likewise, we don't naturally run the Christian life. We have to train ourselves. We have to make our bodies obey the mission instead of allowing our bodies to determine the mission. Does that make sense? So, because my, my, my sinful nature wants to determine the mission, and that's just me sitting on the side of the road watching everybody run by. That is not the Christian life. 
Christian life is a race that we run, and we have to make ourselves do it, train ourselves to do it. It requires, first of all, that we be trained in the Word of God. Take a look at what it says here in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. In fact, though, by this time, he's uh, the, the writer of Hebrews. We don't know if it's Paul who it was. But he is getting on to them because, man, they have gotten off the track and they're not running the race and they're over in the shade. In fact, though, by this time, you ought to be teachers. You should be able to teach people. You still need, if you will, someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food, he says, is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves. There's the, there's the statement. To distinguish good from evil. You don't naturally do that. You have to be trained in the word. That word trained there is a Greek, in the Greek is the same word that we use where we get our English word from uh, gymnastics or gymnasium, literally a workout. We have to work ourselves out in the Word. We don't naturally gravitate to the Word. We have to make ourselves do it. We have to force ourselves. Train yourself. The Word of God is key to us being in shape spiritually. It requires uh, training in the Word in order to, be, to run the Christian life, uh, the, the Christian marathon. Uh, it also requires, number two, uh, training in prayer. Look at Daniel chapter 6, uh, verse 5. It's going to be on your screen here. Uh, Daniel was a man of God, and uh, the people there, he was one of the chief guys, the people there were trying to get at him. His co-workers were trying to knock him off of the pedestal that the king of Persia had placed him on, and uh, they couldn't find anything wrong with Daniel, though. Nothing wrong with his work life, his private life, his social life, his, his government life. Everything in every way was flawless. The only place where they thought they may be able to get at him was in his religious life. Because he was very religious. He was faithful, in particular, to pray three times a day. They knew if they made a law to stop prayer, which is effectively what they did, that Daniel wouldn't obey that law. They were absolutely right. Talk about a guy who was trained in prayer. He was a real runner, Daniel. Finally, he says, these men, it, it says, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. He knew he wouldn't do it. This was a man who was trained in prayer. So we've got to be trained in the Word. We've got to be trained in prayer. You've got to make yourself. It doesn't just naturally happen. we also to be trained in godly living. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. It's going to be on your screen. 7 and 8. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself. The same word where we get gymnastics from. Train yourself to be godly. Don't naturally do that. Train yourself. You have to force yourself. By physical training, for physical training is of some value, right? But how long does that last? So there's a lot of us that believe in being physically fit, and I'm, I'm, I'm agree with that. We want to eat well, we want to take vitamins, we want to do exercise, we want to take care of our heart, we want to take care of our life, but how long is that going to last us? No matter what you do with yourself, you're still going to get sick eventually someday and die. Just the facts. So it only has benefits for this life and only for a short part of this life. Physical training is of some value, Paul says, but godliness has value of, for, for all things, holding promise both for the present life and the life to come. So I'm working out physically fit, eating vitamins, but I don't take care of myself spiritually. Is that very smart? It's not very smart. You find yourself on the sidelines, albeit physically fit, but not spiritually fit. Not very smart. Get up and run. Train yourself in prayer, in godliness, in the Word of God. The Christian life is like a marathon. The Christian life is like a marathon for a second reason, in that both demand extraordinary endurance. Christian life is not a 100-yard dash. In fact, it's not even a marathon. A marathon's over 26 miles. Christian life lasts the whole life. There's not a time I stop. Now, nothing wrong with taking a vacation. Nothing wrong with taking a breather. In some cases, that's what's going on maybe in your life right now. But listen, don't let it go too long. We get used to doing nothing. Get used to letting somebody else do it. Don't. They can't run the race for you. Only you can run your own race. Christian life is a, is a marathon. It's not a 100-yard dash. If someone said the Christian life lived well is a long obedience in the same direction. 
A long obedience, not a short obedience. You had a great year, great. What about this year? You had a great month last month, great. What about this month? You had a great decade in the past 10 years. What about these 10 years? Don't stop. And if you do, get back up. Keep going. It's a lifelong race. The Bible has a lot to say about spiritual endurance. I'm going to give you three different verses here, starting off first in Hebrews. Oh, that's not it. In fact, I'm not sure where that is. I must have forgotten these somehow. Hold on. James. There, let's do that one. Blessed is the one. Let's go back. I think that's it. By faith, this is Hebrews. I just didn't, the, the address up at the top says Matthew, but actually this is Hebrews uh, chapter 11, verse 27. Sorry about that. Anyway, this is the verse. By faith, Moses left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered. There's the word. Because he saw him who is invisible. He stuck with it. He persevered. He hung in there. He didn't care what the king of Egypt thought. He didn't care the difficulty he was going to face because he knew the thing that mattered the most was the stuff that he couldn't see yet. And so he stuck with it. Now, it's, the next one is correctly addressed. James 1, 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres. Same word, under trial, because... Trials can sideline us, can't it? That's what happened. COVID was a trial, wasn't it? It's busted a bunch of us. Set us back. Changed us. Got out of our regular routine. And routines are great because, especially when we're doing the right thing in those routines, because they keep us coming back. They, they keep us accountable. And, and if anything, COVID broke that routine and broke us out of what we should have been doing and got us used to doing stuff that maybe we shouldn't be doing, or at least not doing the things we should. Having stood the test, it says that person will receive the crown of life. There's that prize that Paul talked about, that the Lord has promised those who love him. So, so if I don't persevere, I don't get the prize? You got it. Heaven's not in question here. Heaven's not a prize. You don't earn that. Jesus earned that. Heaven's not something you earn. It's something Jesus earned, right? Get your theology right. But there is a prize for you to earn, and that's what you do with the eternal life that he's given you in this life. So if you don't live respectful to the eternal life that God's given you, and honor that by running the race, you're not going to get a crown. Sorry, you didn't persevere. Get up. Run. Here's another one, James 5, verse 11. As you know, or do you? Maybe that's a good question. We count as blessed those who have persevered. There it is again. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Job had a hard race, didn't he? Wow. Wow, I'm not saying you're not having a hard time, but, you know, no offense, but I bet it's not as hard as Job had it. Lost all of his kids, lost all of his income, all of his livelihood, support of his wife, support of his friends, everything, and yet he kept his integrity, the Scripture says. He stayed with it, and then God turned it all back around. Don't give up. Have endurance. Hang in there, especially when the running gets hard. So the Christian life is like a marathon in that it takes extraordinary endurance. It's also like a marathon in that we have to run by the rules. Look at what Paul says, 2 Timothy 2, 5. Anyone who competes as an athlete does not receive the victor's crown except by competing according to the rules. So you've got gifts and talents. Awesome. What about integrity? You can get by by the seat of your pants because of your abilities and your know-how and your knowledge of the Scriptures. But listen, without integrity, without integrity, listen, you won't win this race. There has to be what's on the outside. It has to be the same on the inside. That's what integrity means. I'm in integrated. Outside's the same as the inside. I'm not a fake. I'm not just doing it because people are watching. I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do and it's conviction between me and God. No matter what the fast, uh, how fast you run, how good you are, listen, if you don't compete according to the rules, you will not be able to win. And to be sure, sin is breaking the rules. Hebrews 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, like a stadium in a race, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Sin will keep you from running the race, keep you from winning the prize. We have to run according to the rules. The Christian life is 
like a race, like a marathon, in that you have to compete according to the rules. And then a final reason why it's like a marathon. Christian life is like a marathon. Because both the old and coveted prize have been referring to this. What is this? Heaven's not a gift. Or actually, it is a gift to you, but it's not a prize that you win. Jesus won that prize on the cross. We're about to celebrate Easter here in a little over a week. Celebrate what Jesus did. He won the prize for you to go to heaven. Heaven is not a prize to you. In fact, you are a prize to him. But what quality is that prize? Are you squandering the eternal life that he's given to you? Are you running or are you on the sidelines? He's given you everlasting life. And you're doing nothing with it or hardly anything? Hmm. See how you have a problem with that? It yields a coveted Prize, verse 25, again, everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They do it for a perishable wreath. Literally, when they run, win a Greek contest, these gold medals and stuff are not necessarily from the Greek uh, games. That's a, a more recent invention in the Olympics. All they got was this little laurel wreath, this little thing made out of pine branches, pine boughs. They put it on their head. And you talk about something that's perishable, definitely. He says, they ran... So you're going to run 26 miles to get pine boughs in your head? Yeah, because at least it, in the short term it made you a champion, right? They do it for a receipt to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. The forever and ever, you're going to have the moniker of you ran the weight race well. Or, forever and ever, you're going to have the moniker, listen, of that you didn't. Well, I don't believe heaven's going to be a place where there's no regrets. Who told you that? Your mom or your preacher, listen, if you didn't get it from the Bible, and I'm telling you, you didn't, you're welcome to read it. I read it through a bunch. That theology does not exist. Heaven's going to be a place for some of regret. Part of that's going to be regret that you didn't live the life that you were supposed to live down here that God has given to you by grace. Eternal life doesn't start when you get to heaven. Eternal life starts when you accept Christ. What have you done with that? How are you running with that? Take a look at a couple of these verses. Philippians 3, 14. I press on, here's Paul, toward the goal to win the prize. There it is. It's not eternal life. But it's something that's going to matter eternally, for which God has called me heavenward. He's already gotten the call. There's a prize in running the race. Paul says, though I determined to run that race, heavenward in Christ Jesus. Here's 2 Timothy 4. Oh, come on. It's going to come. Nope. I didn't, I didn't give you that. We already read that one. I'm sorry. 2 Timothy 4, uh, ver, verses six, 7 and 8 says, says a similar thing to Paul says to Timothy. So what would keep you from getting the prize? What would that be? What's, what's hindering you now if you li your life ended right now and you stood before Jesus? What would you have to say? What, what, what would keep you today from winning that prize? What would you say to him about the way you've run the race? Do you need to make some changes so that what you may regret today you will not regret then. This is your opportunity. Run. Run. Christian life is like a marathon. That was the first major point. Now the second major point. We're getting close to the end, by the way. Hang in there. Not all who enter the race win the prize. We've already been referring to that here in verse 24, etc. Uh, does this mean that not only, only one believer out of all the millions actually wins? Well, this is not the same type of race. In fact, we're all in our all in individual races. In fact, we're all on the same team. We all win together. So, but I'm running my race, and you're running your race, and I'm running according to the capacities that God has given me and the call God has given me, the expectations God has placed on me, and you're doing the same, the expectations God has given you and the call he's given to you, and my expectations and your expectations are not the same. They're different races. Yours is yours, mine is mine. You will not ever, listen, be beaten out of your prize. But you can, and many will, disqualify themselves. Disqualify themselves. Have you disqualified yourself because of your attitude about the Christian life that God has given to you? We're not in competition with each other. 
And we don't lose because we're beaten. We lose because we disqualify ourselves. Again, notice what Paul says here in verse 27. But I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly after I have preached to others, kind of like me right now, I myself should not be disqualified. Again, heaven is not in question here. It's the prize that is in question. Paul thought it was possible if he wasn't careful, if he didn't run, if he got himself sidelined, that even though he preached to others about how they need to be faithful in the race, that he himself could lose the prize. Hmm. Paul could lose it. So can you. So can I. It can be done. So don't let it happen. He makes his body serve the mission, remember? Instead of making, allowing his body to set the mission. Don't do that. Your body, your sin nature, does it naturally run the Christian life. You have to train it. You have to force it. You have to get up every day and say, I'm going to charge at it again. I got sidelined yesterday. I got my legs chopped out from under me. I got the rug pulled out from under me. But today I'm getting a new rug. Today I'm going to start running again. Today I'm going to do what God's called me to do. I'm not going to quit. I'm going to persevere. Incredibly important we understand this. Many are in danger of disqualification because although they ran hard at first, they dropped off near the end. We've got a number of examples here in the Bible, both Old and New Testament. One was Demas in 2 Timothy. Paul refers to him in another book uh, in which Demas was a faithful missionary side by side with Paul. But in 2 Timothy, he says he is a guy who has now fallen by the wayside because, as he says, quote unquote, he loved the world. Demas disqualified himself. He's going to be in heaven. But no less, as far as we know, remained disqualified. Solomon ran the race, right? He's a great guy. He's the wisest guy who ever lived outside of Christ. And yet he got disqualified in the end because he loved his wives more than he loved the race, serving God. Samson was a similar guy. He allowed his lust to disqualify him. Such a gifted man, such a powerful man, had the great potential, and yet he allowed himself to be disqualified. We're going to see him in heaven. As far as we know, they lost their prize. Don't let it happen. To you. Don't let it happen. So, not all who enter the race will win the prize, but here's the final major point, and we're going to be done. All are potential winners. Verse 24 again. Do you not know that those who run all run the race, all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Every one of us, that's a command to us. Run in such a way that you may win. Train yourself in the Word. Train yourself in godly living. Train yourself in prayer. Push yourself. Make yourself go. Make yourself accountable. Part of being accountable is coming to church and going to Bible study. Because people know, I'm dropping out. I'm not studying the Bible. I'm not doing it. Well, okay. You got people that are sitting there saying, what? what are you doing then? Stop that. They can pray for you. Hold you accountable. We need accountability in this race. We're all running together. We're all partners in this race. All are potential winners. All of us are. There is no arbitrary limit to those who can win the prize. Olympic medals are not won by half-hearted people. Neither is the Christian prize won by half-heartedness. It's won by wholeheartedness. Are you wholehearted today? Followers of Christ, not just admirers of Christ. Jesus doesn't need any more admirers. Followers, daily dying Daily taking up their cross, denying themselves, and not until they do those things, can they follow him. Are you following him? Because he's on the move. Talk about a runner. That was Jesus, right? So if you're going to follow him, you've got to run. You've got to run. Let's pray together. God, I thank you that you've called us to this Christian life. I thank you that this race is a race that we can run with your help with your word, with the encouragement and strength that we receive from others, with the power and the dwelling of your Holy Spirit, we're able to run this race. I pray for the one who's been sidelined, who's gotten discouraged, who's fallen out of accountability, who's fallen maybe seemingly out of necessity because they don't feel like they're needed anymore. I pray that that one right now hearing me would get up and run again, that he or she would recommit themselves to stand, to train, to make themselves, instead of allowing their bodies to determine the mission, making their bodies obey the mission, the commission, 
that you've given to us. Thank you, God, for speaking to us today. Bless this now in the hearing of your people. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.